This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 903, recorded on May 26th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. So I understand you don't want to do another hour update, Daniel. (laughs) Well, actually, uh, maybe that's what my quotation this week is about. Maybe that was a little too much. Um, So the the quotation, (laughs) we'll get right into it. The best doctor gives the least medicine. And that's by Ben Franklin. Um, So I'm going to start right ahead, Vincent, by mentioning um, your pick from TWIV 902, uh, the article, Physicians Spreading Misinformation on Social Media, Do Right and Wrong Answers Still Exist in Medicine? It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, I'm also going to lament that this is behind a paywall. Um, cause I really think stuff like this, um, you know, needs to be out there for everyone, not just what, uh, academicians who, you know, are like basically just nodding their heads saying, yes, yes, we, we need this to be part of the discussion. But I will say the first sentence I thought was golden. Um, medicine has a truth problem in the era of social media and heavily politicized science truth is increasingly crowdsourced. If enough people like, share, or choose to believe something, others will accept it as true. That's beautiful. That's absolutely the problem we have, right, Daniel? Yep. Yep. It's it's so true. Um, So, you know, I will say that uh, I'm thinking a lot of physicians and scientists um, should clarify when they say something. Um, And they should say, this is evidence-based, this is what the science shows, Um, instead of just giving an opinion and then hoping that when they're right, they can then retweet that back out there and say, see, I knew, I knew, Um, you know, because yeah, you'll, you'll be, uh, you'll, you'll be right, you know, just like a broken clock at at least two times a day. Um, (laughs) But (laughs) but that's not what science is about. Science is saying, I don't know. And then finding out the answer. If you go into science, anytime you say, oh, I knew, <laughs> you basically, uh, yeah, maybe science is in the right place for you who uh, thinks that they know things before the science is done, before the experiments are finished. Um, so I am going to go ahead and actually also agree with the closing sentence um, of this, um, one of the closing sentences, um, but it is a little bit U.S. centric. But they are talking, I think, about um, U.S. physicians and scientists here when they say this. Um, with nearly one million Americans dead from COVID and deaths, some of them clearly preventable, continuing at a rate of more than 200,000 per year, it has become imperative for our profession to empower our institutions to signal clearly who is and who is not providing evidence-based information. So, Daniel, this is a real problem with social media, as you know, and that's why we com- I complain about the cardiologists, but it's really a mantra for anyone going outside of their lane, uh, making proclamations that are clearly wrong because they don't know better. And so this is not good because a lot of people are hanging on their word and they they need to be right. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think this is, and we will spend a little bit of time here. I was, I was going to move on, but no, this is, I think, important. Um, you know, in like, let's say the Twitter format, the 250 characters, it's really not enough to really express um, scientific truth. It might be enough to steer t- someone towards an article where they can then read through. I mean, that, that's about as many characters are allowed in a, a title, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, before you even get to the abstract. So we now know, you know, uh, you know, 90% of people, you know, only read the title, then a, a few more percent of people read the abstract. And then there's like a couple of us, right, that actually read the whole article. Um, and so I think it is tough because, yeah, there are quote unquote um, thought opinion leaders out there and they say things. And I think we really have to be careful because in those 250 characters, what's actually being said um, in this sort of sound bite um, can easily be taken um, by someone as um, mm-hmm. you know, confirmation bias of whatever they're thinking, as opposed to really getting into the the actual evidence. Um, but no, I would almost like, as we've talked about with, you know, vaccine efficacy, 
we say against what? And when you say something, I think it should be like, hey, this is my opinion. I'm throwing darts. I hope I'm right. Please forget if I said this, if I was wrong, as opposed to, you know, this is the science. This is evidence-based comment. That's why we do these one and two hour podcasts, because that's what it takes to discuss a paper properly. So if you don't know how to read a paper, you don't understand it, listen to our podcasts and we go through it for you. I think that is what you should. And when I use Twitter, I use it to say, hey, I just released a a new podcast with Daniel on monkeypox. Go listen to it. I'm not going to give you the bottom line on Twitter. It doesn't help. Yeah. You yeah, know, I mean, it's interesting. I it was, uh, I'm, I'm usually sort of one way directional on Twitter. I think much like you, Vincent, where I, I yeah. put stuff out there, um, you know, and I think it was a week or two ago, someone was like, oh, I understand you're having this Twitter feud. And I was like, what? Because <laughs> I, I don't really, <laughs> and they showed me, I was like, oh, interesting. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and, you know, and one of the things they showed me is, is someone made a comment, well, you know, he's been wrong about other things. And I mean, the interesting thing, and hopefully I've tried to do this, is as I share what the science is. So I'm, I've never been wrong about that. I mean, I, I show you what the science is. Mm-hmm. I discuss the articles. That's what we know. Um, you know, I, I try not to then say, because of this, I'm going to make this proclamation of truth. So, uh, so I'll and, give you an example, Daniel. Yeah. The other day on Twitter, the cardiologist tweeted <laughs> about a paper testing a mucosal COVID vaccine in mice. And the the cardiologist tweeted, this is a variant proof vaccine, which is as as wrong as you can be because it's not even in people, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, it is. It is challenging. So maybe for our listeners, just I know it's a little harder, right, to actually get through these longer um, venues. But if you really want truth and I, and I do think maybe we've learned in the last two years that it is important to be educated about these topics, about virology and other scientific topics. So, um, yeah, this is the format it takes. And learning is not a crowd based thing. You don't learn when everybody on Twitter says this is so you have to read and watch and listen and think take tests on your own. That's how you listen. And so this uh, idea, this, this, they, they got it right on in this uh, article, this yeah. old idea that this truth problem. And uh, I think the answer is yes, there are still right and wrong answers in medicine though. Right, Daniel? <laughs> Well, no, and I think that's I think that's key. Um, and you can't, you know, as as a physician, your responsibility is not to sleep well at night, feeling like you've done, you know, right by yourself. You should mm-hmm. sleep well at night, feeling like you've done right by your patient. And ninety percent of our good ideas, our non evidence based ideas, turn out not to be helpful. So, um, yeah, practice evidence based medicine. I mean, I know thirty years ago when this was first being introduced to medicine, if you can believe that, um, it was controversial. But I think it's very clear now that evidence-based medicine is what is expected from people in our profession. All right. And along these lines, uh, the article, Excess Mortality in Massachusetts During the Delta and Omicron Waves of COVID-19, was published in JAMA. Uh, just will briefly mention it in this study that they found that more all-cause excess mortality occurred in Massachusetts during the first eight weeks of the Omicron period than during the entire 23-week Delta period. Um, There was excess mortality in all adult age groups, including in younger age groups. So just, uh, um, I don't know if we keep saying that enough, people will appreciate that uh, it it is not innocuous uh, to get infected. Um, So you remember the tweets early in the Omicron about how it was mild and everyone was going to get naturally immunized with no disease. That's an example of what we're talking about, right? People were actually encouraged, right? People yeah. went out based on that, I will say, bad advice. Um, you know, this is that vaccine that the pharmaceutical companies couldn't produce. Go out there and get it while you can. Um, so, yeah, just and, and I think that's that there's responsibility that comes with people saying things like that. So. Um, All right, children, COVID, other vulnerable populations. Um, I was recently asked by a friend of mine, ICU um, physician, um, if I have noticed if there's any evidence out there that there might be more bronchospasm with Omicron. And so that's Mm -hmm. that wheezing, um, that's that um, closing of the upper airways. Um, So I I kept my eyes open and a, a couple papers, the first paper, Croup associated with SARS-CoV-2, pediatric laryngotracheitis during the Omicron surge was just published in JPIDS, JPIDS. 
Um, you'll hear much about that journal on the um, PUSCast. Uh, it's a favorite of Sarah Dong's. Um, this was a small retrospective analysis describing weekly croup and corresponding viral prevalence patterns in a pediatric quaternary care system in metropolitan Atlanta. And they characterized a series of 24 patients with croup associated with SARS-CoV-2 infection and suggested that this clinical presentation increased substantially in frequency during the period of high Omicron versus Delta transmission. Um, the other article, rhinovirus as the main co-circulating virus during the COVID-19 pandemic in children, was published in Journal de Pediatria. Um, and these investigators were looking at the prevalence of a large array of respiratory pathogens in symptomatic children and adolescents during the pandemic in southern Brazil. 436 participants included, 45 hospitalized. Rhinovirus was the most prevalent pathogen followed by RSV uh, with a co-infection occurring in 31 of the 436. So, um, you know, just sort of, uh, we are seeing maybe a little bit more of this bronchospasm, um, but it's not clear to me if this is a change in the virus, if part of this is being driven by co-infections. It's not surprising because rhinoviruses are the most common causes of respiratory infections, right? So it's not surprising you would see it uh, along with SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. And I mean, now that things have changed, right, we're seeing a lot of these viral infections out of season. A lot of these other viral infections are associated with that bronchospasm. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and also the, the levels of rhinovirus during lockdown, masking and so forth didn't change as did some of the other respiratory viruses like influenza. And so that yeah. is probably also playing into it. Why it didn't change is, is a good question. It may be that it's not so much uh, transmitted by droplets, but more touching. And yeah, contact. maybe more of a contact issue. Yeah. yeah. I mean, hopefully we're going to learn a lot when we bring all that data together. Um, all right. Now I have updated. We are now in a different stage of the pandemic. So let me change this to use tests intelligently. <laughs> Now, Vince and I are on the same page here. Uh, last time we talked a little bit about the guidance and the rules around isolation of the infected and quarantine. Um, but let, let's go a little bit uh, deeper into the science here. Um, this is not, I don't want people to feel like, oh, you've just thrown up your hands, Dr. Griffin. Um, things have changed. And as things have changed, as we have different tools, uh, the calculus, the risk calculus has changed as well. Um, so I want to talk about the article, um, Infectious Viral Shedding of SARS-CoV-2 Delta Following Vaccination, a Longitudinal Cohort Study, uh, posted as a preprint. Um, I really liked this preprint. I'll, I'll say that up front. Um, in this study, the investigators compared longitudinal viral shedding dynamics in an unvaccinated and fully vaccinated adults. Um, SARS-CoV-2 infected adults were enrolled within five days of symptom onset and nasal specimens were self-collected daily for two weeks and then intermittently for an additional two weeks. Um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA load and infectious virus were analyzed relative to symptom onset stratified by vaccination status. Uh, they tested 1,080 nasal specimens from 52 unvaccinated adults, 32 fully vaccinated adults. I will mention those 52 unvaccinated were enrolled in the pre-Delta, the 32 fully vaccinated, that was predominantly during Delta. Um, they found no differences by vaccination status in the maximum RNA levels, the maximum infectious titers, um, and the median duration of viral RNA shedding. Um, the rate of decay from the max, maximum RNA load was faster among vaccinated, uh, maximum infectious titers, and maximum RNA levels were highly correlated. Um, this is where I think we get the most important and interesting results. So drum roll, please. Mm -hmm. um, amongst participants with infectious virus, median duration of infectious virus detection was reduced from 7.5 days in unvaccinated participants to six days in those vaccinated. Um, accordingly, the odds of shedding infectious virus from days six to 12 post onset were lower among vaccinated participants than unvaccinated with an odds ratio of 0 0.42. So this is about a 60% reduction in the odds of shedding infectious virus in vaccinated people after day five. 
Um, so these results um, suggest that vaccination had reduced the probability of shedding infectious virus after five days from symptom onset. Um, and I'm going to pull you in here in a second, Vincent, but a, a couple things I want to reinforce here. Um, I want to point out that we're again seeing a disconnect here between viral RNA and infectious virus as time passes from symptom onset. So I think time is, is critical when you're doing this calculation. Um, but, but I do want to say we're also seeing sort of confirmation of something that I feel like a lot of people are missing. We are still seeing infectious people after day five, and we're going to run into a little new twist coming up. So a couple of points here. First of all, I'm, I'm a little surprised that the uh, the duration of infectious detection is only reduced, you know, a day and a half, basically. And I'm more surprised that the maximum levels are not changed at all. So this tells me that these individuals are probably at least six months out from their vaccine it, when they are depending on a memory response to kick in with antibodies. So the virus is getting in and reproducing. Uh, and so they're protected against severe disease, but not against uh, shedding. Um, and then um, the, the real key, though, is how much virus do you have to shed to infect someone else? And so, you know, this you said we are still seeing people infectious after day five, but how do you know they're transmitting because we don't know how much virus yeah. you need to shed to transmit, right? Yeah. And actually, I, I think that's perfect. So, you know, to to change the wording of the authors into what I think is more honest is saying um, shedding infectious virus, not necessarily infectious to others, right? Because right. again, there's, there's a threshold right. there. Um, but yeah, it is interesting when you think about the kinetics, right? Is that, you know, for those T cells to kick in, it's three to four days. For those memory B cells to kick in, again, it's going to be four to seven mm -hmm. days. It it takes a little bit, right? You know, I mean, if we use that fire extinguisher analogy, you got to go grab the fire extinguisher. By the time you come back, I mean, there's time passes. And if you uh, did this study with any other virus for which we vaccinate, you'd probably find similar results. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting and, and a little bit um, humbling, the idea that, you know, we get back to what do vaccines actually do? They keep people out of the hospital. They keep you from dying. Um, but all these other things we're, we're so focused on, keeping you from getting infected, stopping the transmission cycle, um, that's not really what, what, they, what they do super well. You know, when the polio vaccines were developed, they were developed to prevent paralytic disease. We didn't have PCR, but it would be interesting well, we can't do it anymore because there's not much polio to do this kind of study. And you would see polio virus shedding in vaccinated people. So I don't think this is a condemnation of the vaccine in any way. I think this is the way they work. Yeah, I think it just is an appreciation of how they work, particularly think about the injectable salt. I don't, I don't think we're going to see, you know, much impact there. Yeah. So. All right. So. Active vaccination, never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Now a press release from Pfizer. Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine demonstrates strong immune response, high vaccine efficacy, and favorable safety in children six months to under five years of age following third dose. Um, as we've discussed before, th this is really a immunobridging study where they were demonstrating, you know, antibody levels. And um, But I'm going to actually focus on a secondary endpoint, which is vaccine efficacy, which was a secondary endpoint in this trial. Um, and it is tough, right? Because we keep talking about infection versus severe disease. Severe disease is not very common in um, children six months to five years of age. So the vaccine efficacy here is going to be symptomatic COVID. I was looking for them to spell that out, but they, they sort of don't. So you have to go back to prior. Um, but they were reporting an 80.3% um, reduction vaccine efficacy um, at preventing symptomatic COVID. Um, and we'll leave some links so you can actually look at the press release. There's also another secondary document where you get a little more information. Um, but this is along the lines of the, the optimistic um, going into June that we're going to see uh, vaccines available for the down to six months of age. Um, and this is, I'm going to say the glass is 90% full article. Um, protection of mRNA vaccines against hospitalized COVID-19 in adults over the first year following authorization in the United States, published in CID. Uh, case control analysis of adults greater than or equal to 18 years, hospitalized at 21 hospitals, 18 states, March 11 through December 15, 2021. Um, 
and this was including COVID-19 uh, case patients and RT-PCR negative controls. Um, so they, they looked at unvaccinated, vaccinated, and by vaccinated here, we're looking at two doses of the mRNA vaccine before the date of illness onset. Um, among immunocompetent adults, vaccine efficacy for preventing hospitalization um, in the first 180 days was 90%, and after that, it was still 82%. Um, now, they break it down looking at a couple different um, vaccines, the Pfizer-BioNTech, the Moderna. They look at younger adults. They look at older adults. I'm actually just going to focus on the Moderna vaccine. It's my favorite, by the way. With just two doses demonstrated a vaccine efficacy against hospitalization of 93% and 87%, looking at the first 180 days and then out past 180 days. And I want to point out, that's just two doses. That, that is actually still pretty impressive. Now, I will say the data is largely pre-Omicron variant mm -hmm. circulation. Um, but as the authors conclude, and I will agree, effectiveness of two mRNA doses against COVID-19-associated hospitalization was largely sustained through nine months. So this is my 90% full comment. Now with Omicron, I think it's reasonable to say that this is a three-dose series, but this is pretty reassuring. You mean it's not waning, Daniel? <laughs> Oh, oh no. <laughs> I used the wrong I'm, word, I know, but I did I, it on purpose. <laughs> no, you, you did on purpose. No, and I'm sorry to be so positive, but no, this is very this is very impressive. And then you, you know, you give that third shot. I mean, I, I think I think the mRNA vaccines are continue to be very impressive. All right. Passive vaccination, have you shelled? So remember that for your individuals at high risk. I had another consultation today where this individual was um, not being offered have you shelled. Um, it was sort of a, a difficult story. This is a woman who got the first vaccine and actually had one of those rare complications. She developed a rash. The level of her platelets dropped. It was decided not to give her any more um, vaccine. Um, she ended up with COVID. She's recovered. Um, and now she was interested in have shelled, but her oncologist Apologist, she has a issue there, um, actually was uh, telling her that her antibodies were so good that he really didn't think that she should risk Ebuchel. So uh, please don't do that. Um, the FDA has made it really clear there's no serology test out there um, that can tell you whether or not this person has adequate protection against the current circulating variants. Um, so, you know, go ahead, let's make sure we um, get those um, higher risk people this extra benefit. Um, but I thought this was an interesting idea, this article, Transfusing Convalescent Plasma as Post-Exposure Prophylaxis Against SARS-CoV-2 Infection, a Double-Blinded Phase Through Randomized Control Trial published in CID. Um, so here was that idea. Let's use that high, tighter um, convalescent plasma as prophylaxis. Um, and, you know, we're comparing this to Evu shelled, right, where there's an 83% reduction in symptomatic COVID. Pretty impressive. Um, well, I have to say, um, while appearing safe, convalescent plasma did not prevent infection. Dan Daniel, what is the length of time Evu shelled will sustain that 87%? Reduction? So we... Yeah, so we don't know. We don't know. Um, the current recommendation is that this may be every six months. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, as we go forward, we'll have to see if that gets adjusted. All right, post-exposure period, right? This is when we think about testing. Um, remember, quarantine for those not up to date with vaccines. Um, and really, I have to say, if you are up to date with your vaccines, right? And this is now an issue with uh, kids who now can get that third shot um, down to age six. Um, the only sort of thing that you have to do after exposure is maybe do a test five days after the exposure. Um, but you can go about your day. You don't have to be isolated, um, quarantined, um, et cetera. So there is sort of a big social benefit to having that, um, that third shot in those situations. Um, but we will get ahead because we're going to have some new issues coming up. So now we move into the period of detectable viral replication. You've got that positive test, um, real world data on molnupiravir and Paxlovid. So we have uh, two preprints. The first preprint, real world effectiveness of molnupiravir and nermatrelvir ritonavir, Paxlovid, among COVID-19 inpatients 
during Hong Kong's Omicron BA2 wave, an observational study was posted. Now, this is a retrospective cohort study evaluating the clinical and virological outcomes associated with using malnupiravir and Paxlovid uh, during a pandemic wave dominated by Omicron BA2 in Hong Kong. Kong. Um, so it's a composite outcome we're going to be looking at, all-cause mortality, um, ending up on a ventilator, ending up in the ICU, um, and then there's a, a few other individual outcomes, lower viral load. Uh, well, they say viral load, but I'm going to make that RNA copy number. Um, and what did they find? So they found that oral antiviral use was associated with a significant lower risk of this composite outcome. Malnupiravir hazard ratio 0.53, so about a 50% reduction. Um, Paxlovid 0.33, so about a 70% reduction. Um, when they looked at all cause mortality, very similar about a 45% reduction, about a 70% reduction. Um, but I do want to point out, this is looking at hospitalized patients. So these are patients who ended up in the hospital early. So they're still in that first week. They're not hypoxic. They started within the first couple of days and they still get this benefit. All so right, the implication, next, yeah. Daniel, is that even when you're, when you're hospitalized, there is some benefit to an antiviral. Uh, yes, and I, and actually today I, I got a I got a message from um, uh, Dr. Fatima Johari, one of my colleagues at Northwell, that now they're going to actually have availability because just the fact that you end up in the hospital, right? Some people end up in the hospital because they're dehydrated, they're mm -hmm. having trouble at home. They're still in that window of opportunity. Um, I'm not sure that window really needs to only be three to five days. Um, we're yeah. seeing here you can end up in the hospital even a couple more days go by. Um, but yeah, it's still we're still talking about timing, but ending up in the hospital during that first week okay. for a viral issue should not, you know, make you ineligible. But if you end up in the ICU, then it's probably too late. Then it's probably too late. Yeah. By the time by the time you get past the viral replication phase, it doesn't really okay. make much sense. All right. How about use in outpatients, right? This is what we're supposed to be doing. Get it, get it in there early before you end up in the hospital. Um, another preprint impact of the use of oral antiviral agents on the risk of hospitalization in community COVID-19 patients. Um, a retrospective cohort study from Hong Kong. Um, and they're looking at molnupiravir and Paxlovid um, reducing hospitalization and deaths in a real world cohort non-hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Now, they reported that Paxlovid use was associated uh, with a reduction, um, but they did not see that with malnupiravir in the study. All right. So, Dr. Griffin, this is all so exciting, but I've been hearing all this, this bad stuff about Paxlovid out there. Um, apparently, I, I did an interview on NBC News and millions of, of views. Um, and uh, so <laughs> let's go ahead. What, what was this? The CDC alert, COVID-19 rebound after Paxlovid treatment. Uh, first off, can we please change the title to COVID-19 rebound now identified as part of the natural history of COVID-19 in some individuals? Um, you know, but no one's going to read it unless it's got Paxlovid in the title. So um, it starts in a really positive way with the statement. A brief return of symptoms may be part of the natural history of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 infection in some persons, independent of treatment with Paxlovid and regardless of vaccination status. Um, and I know we discussed last time um, that this was actually seen in the, in the Paxlovid trials in the placebo group. Um, actually, it was seen at roughly the same frequency in that population. Um, they then go on to say, Limited information currently available from case reports suggests that persons treated with Paxlovid who experience COVID-19 rebound have had mild illness. There are no reports of severe disease. There is currently no evidence that additional treatment is needed with Paxlovid or other anti-SARS-CoV therapies in cases where COVID-19 rebound is suspected. Um, and also, as the FDA has pointed out, that is not in the EUA to go ahead and give these people more drug. No science. That is not an evidence-based recommendation, by the way, to treat them again. Now, regardless of whether the patient has been treated with an antiviral agent, um, risk of transmission during COVID-19 rebound can be managed by following CDC's guidance on isolation. Well, this gets a little confusing. That was very vague. What, what is this guidance? Well, here's where, and I will point out, if you keep reading, and you've got to keep reading, 
possible transmission of infection during COVID-19 rebound has been described, and there's a reference that we will discuss. However, it remains unknown whether the likelihood of transmission during rebound differs from the likelihood of transmission during initial infection. Um, and this is, this is the new guidance that's buried in here. People with recurrence of COVID-19 symptoms or a new positive viral test after having tested negative should restart isolation and isolate again for at least five days. All right, so let's discuss what what is this um, what is this reference this uh, reference that is changing CDC guidance because this is new. This is you've isolated, you've used extra precautions for ten days, you're feeling all better, you're out there in the world, and then you have this relapse, um, and then maybe you test positive. The CDC new guidance is should that happen, you again are going to restart that isolation. Another five days of isolation, another five days of precaution. So this is based on a preprint case report, rapid relapse of symptomatic Omicron SARS-CoV-2 infection following early suppression with nermotrelvir ritonavir. So let, I'm going to spend a little time, and, and Vincent, I'm, I'm hoping that you can uh, weigh in on this. Um, but the authors describe relapse of COVID-19 symptoms and SARS-CoV-2 viral load following um, Paxlovid treatment in eight non-immunocompromised adults aged 31 to 71 years old. Um, most patients improved rapidly after treatment with Paxlovid, um, had negative antigen or PCR tests prior to relapse on days 9 through 12 of their illness. Um, and I'm going to sort of stop there and pause for a second. That's actually not what we've been talking about. We've been talking about people make it through that acute illness. They have a week of feeling better. And then it's about day 20 to 25 when suddenly they have a recurrence. This is really an extension of that initial um, period. We'll, we'll discuss more about that, right? Because we say, if you're not feeling great on day 10 or 11, you don't end your isolation. You continue to stay isolated. So I, I will make a few comments like, are we talking about apples and oranges here? Um, relapse symptoms were described most frequently as cold symptoms, although some patients experiencing a relapse of fatigue and headache. All relapses resolved without additional antiviral treatment. Viral load during relapse was comparable to levels during initial infection. Sequencing in three patients indicated that relapse was not due to a treatment emergent mutation or infection with a different viral strain. One patient transmitted SARS-CoV-2 to two family members during relapse. The presence of high viral load and the occurrence of one transmission event suggests that people with relapse should isolate until antigen testing is negative. Um, and I will mention David Ho is the last author on this preprint posting. <laughs> Daniel, I... I do not know how they conclude that this person transmitted during relapse and not before when they're living with their family, right? Yep. That, that's, I mean, it makes you think, oh my gosh, but I doubt there's very good evidence for that. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's, that's one, that's one thing, right? I mean, right. you've got this, was, was that, because the incubation period, right, could be like 14 days. Um, and so you do have to, you do have to, it's a preprint, so we don't get all the information we want. Was it real? Was that it? Was that the only exposure? And in a world that is full of virus, yes. was that really the only exposure? Um, the other, which I think is interesting is I'm not sure this is talking about what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we've described for a really long time, um, we actually discussed this in our publication back in February 2021. So I'm going to quote, um, you know, that we say this appears to be a characteristic feature of the disease process and does not only occur in patients having undergone treatment. Um, and then, as the CDC says, a brief return of symptoms may be part of the natural history of SARS-CoV-2, independent of treatment, independent of vaccination mm -hmm. status. But what, what was being described is you go through your viral phase for the first week. You then have your second week, which is this early inflammatory, goes out to about day 14. These people are still within those 14 days. Mm, right. We're not talking about I was better for 8 to 12 days, as the CDC is talking about. And then I had this return of two to three days of symptoms. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit, I, you know, th this reminds me, I was thinking of the, the people in the, you know, in the airport, you've got to take your shoes off because one guy tried to like sneak yeah. through with a yeah. sneaker bomb. Um, you know, 
one transmission, so one person transmitting, you know, that's an anecdote, right? Well, you know, I say the plural of yeah. anecdote yeah. is, you know, not data. Well, the yeah. singular of anecdote is actually anecdote. Um, so I'm not sure that this anecdote actually really applies to the same situation. We're just basically saying people continue to be um, yeah. potentially infectious out to day 14, which we knew. We're not talking about someone, you know, almost a month later having that yeah. two to three day relapse that we described. So um, yeah, people often do this where, you know, they're really strongly antigen positive, maybe, you know, PCR, of course, and then it becomes negative and then it gets bright again before it finally goes off. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure that this is the, the data, but it has actually changed CDC isolation guidance. I find that very unfortunate that it's based on a preprint which has a number of uncertain conclusions in one patient, as you said. Um, yeah. And this other statement here, viral load during re relapse was comparable, but I'm sure that's PCR, right? And who so that, knows the, yeah. the, I mean, that's, the relevance? Yeah, I mean, that's the challenge. So it is, um, it is CT numbers. I mean, I'm hoping that, you know, David Ho has the BSL three. So I'm, I'm hoping that he really means viral load, right? I mean, it doesn't tell us here. I'm hoping he isn't just saying RNA copy number because um, that's what you would want to know. Are we getting the same viral sure. load, not sure. just RNA copy number? Um, yeah. But so, I mean, but, you want to know a kinetics. You want to know if it went up and down and then up again, or it just went up and, and stayed up for a while before coming down. It's a big difference, right? Yep. And I would, and I would say, I do think people are still a certain percentage of people are still, you know, contagious at day 12, 13, 14. I, I think we've known that. Um, I guess the real question that we're trying to find out, which is being used, is that are people then contagious at day? I mean, do the math. So it's going to be day 25 mm -hmm. and they have two to three days. I mean, I think that that's important to know. I don't think an antigen test gives us that knowledge. I think case, no. con you know, case tracing, transmission studies, viral yeah. culture, there, there's a lot of other things that um, I would like to have here. Um, but I, but what I don't like is the impact it has have. I'm getting lots of questions from providers and patients saying, oh, I hear all this bad stuff about Paxlovid. This is not bad stuff about Paxlovid. Uh, Paxlovid continues to be incredibly effective and is the number one recommended um, mm -hmm. therapeutic option in our patients with risk factors. Number two is the IV remdesivir. Number three is bebtilovimab, the monoclonal still standing. Um, and a distant fourth is malnupiravir. All right, let's move into the early inflammatory phase. Um, steroids at the right time in the right patients, anticoagulation um, adjusted for the individual patient, pulmonary support, maybe remdesivir if we're still early, um, immunomodulation added on to that if needed. Um, and remember, avoid those unnecessary antibiotics and unproven therapies. And then should we move into that secondary infection risk phase, that multi-system inflammatory phase? Um, as we described, sometimes we're seeing people start to have problems for two to three days. That's when we start asking, is there a secondary bacterial, a fungal infection, a clotting issue, or is it part of this bimodal nature of the illness that, um, that we've been describing for two years now? All right, the tail phase and long COVID. Um, the article, A Longitudinal Study of COVID-19 Sequelae and Immunity Baseline Findings. Um, this was a study, um, and this is actually NIH, right? So this is a study to characterize medical sequelae and persistent symptoms um, after recovery from COVID-19 in a cohort of disease survivors and controls. This is ACP journals. Self-referred adults with laboratory documented SARS-CoV-2 infection um, who were at least six weeks from symptom onset were enrolled regardless of presence of post-acute sequelae of COVID. A control group comprised patients with no history of COVID-19 or serological evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, both groups were enrolled over the same period of time, um, and this is sort of disappointing, despite extensive diagnostic evaluations, uh, they were not able to find any specific cause of the reported symptoms in most cases. I'll go on to an MMWR, post-COVID conditions among adult COVID-19 survivors aged 18 to 64 and greater than 65 years, United States, March 2020, November 2021. Uh, these are the results of a retrospective matched cohort design um, used to analyze EHRs during March 2020, November 2021 from Cerner Real World data. So we're looking at 63.4 million unique adult records. Um, they reported that COVID-19 survivors had twice the risk for developing pulmonary embolism 
or respiratory conditions. Um, and this is the one that got all the, dead, all, the, all the headlines. They are saying one in five COVID-19 survivors aged 18 to 64 years and one in four survivors aged greater than 65 experienced at least one incident condition that might be attributable to previous COVID-19. Uh, so notice all those qualifications. Might be attributable, um, at least one incident condition, um, I'm not sure how much to make of this. And, and I do want to point, you know, when, whenever we talk about, oh my gosh, you know, and this is the headline, you know, one in five, 20% of people with COVID now have long COVID. I'm not sure they're saying that. Um, and if you actually spend a little time going through this, um, I don't think you're going to see that. Long COVID is a significant issue. It's not something I want to downplay, but it's also not something that I, I think we need to be dishonest about or overstate. Um, now, my PSA for long COVID is that recover studies are enrolling, and we're going to leave a link in our show notes, studies.recovercovid.org. Um, as of May 24th, recover studies had already enrolled over 3,000 participants. So uh, I want people to, um, to consider enrolling, consider encouraging others to enroll. Um, but our final article, Trajectory of Long COVID Symptoms After COVID-19 Vaccination, Community-Based Cohort Study published in the BMJ. Um, another positive um, observational cohort finding uh, from the UK where the authors report that the likelihood of long COVID symptoms was observed to decrease after COVID-19 vaccination and evidence suggested sustained improvement after a second dose, at least over the median follow-up of 67 days. So this may remain to date our only true evidence-based um, therapeutic for long COVID. All right. No one is safe until everyone is safe. So this is where I ask everyone to pause the recording. Um, if you're driving, uh, you know, pull off to the side of the road. Um, well, maybe that's not such a great idea. Pause the recording. And when you get to a place where you can, uh, jump on, go to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com, click that donate button. Every small amount helps with our work and also our continuing FIMRIC fundraiser. Uh, during the months of May, June, and July, donations made to Parasites Without Borders will be matched and doubled up to a potential donation of $40,000. Um, mainly, we're going to be focusing support on the uh, clinic in the Baduda district of eastern Uganda. Time for some of your questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. Susie writes, I'm a pediatric infectious diseases physician with five partners at a children's hospital. We are still testing all routine admissions, but are under increasing pressure to stop. I have concerns about our immunocompromised patients and our patients at risk for severe disease. If we learn they are positive on admission, we could potentially intervene. We would also have better ability to keep common areas of the hospital safe. Do you have any thoughts about routine hospital admission testing? So I, I do. I mean, this is a great question. And, and I'll bring up a, a scenario that I ran into um, a couple of weeks ago. As a patient came in and they had had COVID six weeks ago um, and their, their PCR was positive, right? So suddenly they're, they're locked in an isolation room. No one's visiting them. Um, I was asked to weigh in. And so um, we had them run the, uh, the PCR on a machine where we could actually get the CT value. And the CT value came back at 42 and my first question was, how many cycles are you running this machine? Because um, wh what are we trying to do? Um, you know, we're not trying to make the diagnosis. We're trying to keep other people safe. So running that out to 45 cycles, that's, that's a little bit much. Um, if we're trying to do screening to make sure we're not bringing infectious, contagious people, we're trying to keep other patients safe. Um, if you're going to use PCR, I don't think you need to run it 45 times. You can actually think, um, and maybe it would be reasonable for us to start dropping that. Maybe 30 or 35 is, is reasonable. And you stop the machine. If you haven't picked it up by then, you're not bringing a, a contagious person in. Um, consider antigen tests. It's actually quicker. You can get you know, people in. You can even do another antigen test the next day if you want to be safe. So I think we do want to keep uh, people safe. Um, the, the hospital is a, a scary place and we want to uh, really rebuild the confidence in there. We, we don't want people coming into the hospital and getting COVID. Um, but I think there's more intelligent ways to do this. So start looking into how many cycles are you running those PCRs? Um, what's really the goal? And then making sure we do testing intelligently. Zach writes, I received a booster shot and am on Evusheld due to an immune system suppressed by Remicade. I received my Evusheld in early April mRNA booster, 
in December. Moderna, Moderna, Pfizer. I'm 41, mildly overweight, Crohn's, otherwise in good health. My next infliximab infusion is mid-June. What would be the best time to take my second booster? I have a very forward-facing job, a lot of indoor interactions with the public. I wear an N95, but want to give myself the best chance to avoid serious complications if I am infected. Yeah, so our, the guidance, and we actually have nice guidance from the rheumatological associations as well, um, is really trying to space that sort of a two-week between. So the infliximab, um, that's one of our TNF-alpha monoclonal antibody um, therapies. Um, so you're targeting the TNF-alpha. Um, and so in your case, what you want to do is you want to try to time it so that you're sort of least immune um, impacted. So about two weeks apart is what uh, most of us are recommending, sort of in line with the guidance. Lori writes, I'm a pediatrician in a busy private practice in San Francisco with so many questions, but I will limit them to three. One, parents of five to 11 year olds want to know if they should get the booster now or wait until fall unless visiting grandma or other high risk individuals over the summer. Yeah. So, I mean, this hits a couple of things. One is, um, you know, there's a lot of virus out there right now. So now's a reasonable time to get it. There's also the advantage, right, is that this removes you from all these societal restrictions associated with not being up to date with your vaccines, the, the quarantine, you know, and with summer camp and all these summer activities. I'm actually encouraging most, um, most parents of children in this age group to go ahead now um, with at least a couple of weeks before a lot of these summer things fire up um, so that they then, you know, say sort of June is the time for boosting um, so they can really enjoy the summer. Number two, everyone wants Paxlovid. You mentioned that the prescribing slope is getting slipperier, and I just learned from you that LD is a risk factor. We're trying hard to hold the line. It seems like it is not a benign drug, plus the rebound issue could complicate things. People are now asking for a 10-day course. Are we doing our patients with mild asthma and or ADHD a disservice in saying no? Uh, well, I think the first part is, you know, and we've tried to point this out, the, the FDA, the EUA approval is not for 10 days. It's for five and it's just for five. You know, I, I don't want people to think that, you know, the Paxlovid rebound is terrible. It shouldn't have been termed that. This biphasic, this rebound is part of the natural history. It's something we've seen for two years. Um, we so far have no science to suggest that it's more common with Paxlovid. Um, we also have no science to suggest that you should wait and not give that Paxlovid till day five to somehow interfere with this. Um, that is not evidence-based guidance out there. Um, but you are right. It is a slippery slope. So you do want to have these conversations. Um, you know, It really has been made that uh, who doesn't qualify for Paxlovid? It seems like almost everyone qualifies under some learning disability or something else. Um, so, you, you know, as, as a physician, um, as physicians, as clinicians, and as pharmacists, um, we really need to use our judgment. We need to have those difficult conversations. Um, your patient's decision to end up in Paxlovid should be evidence-based. It should be based upon that decision, not based upon what they read in the popular press or what they hear about on social media. And number three, what are your thoughts about the initial data on the Pfizer three-dose immunizations for the under fives? It seems a little underwhelming to me at this juncture. <laughs> You know, it is it is tough. And as we've talked about that data, we've so far just have the press release. Um, as we move forward, as we get actually the full data, we'll definitely um, revisit that. All right. One more from Moro. When Moderna and or Pfizer get EUA for kids five and under, do they just use the same vial for adults and prepare more syringes with less volume or do they have a special formulation? I'm asking because we're eager to get our daughter vaccinated and we're wondering if we'd have to wait for kids' special formulations to be delivered. Um, one of the nice things I will say is um, once this gets approved uh, within 24 hours, I expect those vials to be out there. I don't think you're going to have to go and have someone try to drop smaller doses, um, but they already have uh, different color caps. This is all ready to go. It's the same formulation. It's just a smaller dose. Um, and those are all, you know, ready to go. So uh, come June, when we anticipate approval, I don't think there'll be any big waiting for the supplies to arrive. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 116 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone be safe.